in the in our hand. All right, welcome everybody. Um, so it's it's been a hard week with everything going on. Um, I just want to take a, a moment in the beginning just to say for anyone who's new that's joining us either online or, or, or here, you know, the Osuli Institute, um, we're you know very proud to be able to talk about things um, in a way I think that are, are different than in other organizations. You know, we really value critical thinking and we try to speak the truth about things even when they're really uncomfortable. And because I think that really truth is so important with, to grow and to move forward as a community and also as individuals. And usually I also give a, a brief introduction or, you know, talk in this introduction and try to just, um, you know, balance out, like the professor will talk very deeply about knowledge and scholarship and things like that. And I try to bring the voice of a convert and a woman and just kind of someone who's trying to figure things out, um, you know, not a scholar, um, and hopefully try and just shed a little bit of a different angle on things. And so, of course, this was such a painful week with everything going on in New Zealand, and I, um, I hope you have a chance to watch the khutbah um, from yesterday that the professor gave at the Islamic Center, which is online and available either on YouTube or on our, our website, because it was very powerful. And I think that a lot of times you just need to hear people come out and say things truthfully, and it's part of the healing process and part of understanding what's going on. I mean, there's so much for us to learn about why this happened and what can we do about it. You know, people have been writing to us, you know, so sad and so upset and you know and especially now that the stories are coming out where we're learning you know who were these people and what were their stories and, and what was happening to them when they were going through this and all of us have been there we all know what it feels like to be sitting quietly in the mosque and you know and having that imagination of someone coming in and starting to shoot you know um, I, I mean I have to admit that every time we go to an Islamic center where the professor is speaking that thought always crosses my mind and it's very chilling and I always, you know, I'm very nervous about it. So, um, you know, of course, um, you know, all of us, I think, feel like we've lost so much and, you know, we're, we're all together in it. So um, it's really, you know, um, inshallah, may, may Allah, you know, comfort everyone there. And may we all, moving forward, do everything that we can to try and make a difference. So I know that, you know, all of the different emotions that I've been going through, one of the emotions that is emerging is a lot of anger. And I, I'm so, like, fed up and done with this white nationalist BS. And, you know, the feeling that Muslims are, you know, on the receiving end of Islamophobia and everything coming out of that, and that people feel, you know, the effects of Islamophobia in very obvious and also very subtle ways. And we see a lot of this because a lot of times people will write to us, they'll contact us, they're struggling with their faith, they're struggling with the idea, you know, is God a loving God? Is God harsh? Is God going to punish me? You know, do I really want to be Muslim? And, you know, and then when things like this happen, you know, and um, it's really hard to understand what's going on. And the thing that has been, you know, it's, it's really hard to address these types of issues if you don't have the requisite education and the requisite knowledge about what's going on with Islamophobia. Because it appears to be one thing, but when you actually take the time to study what's going on behind the scenes, it's shocking to you. And the things that can act as an antidote to Islamophobia, whether it is you know, killing people or whether it's just putting seeds of doubt in your own faith and whether you want to be Muslim or not. If you don't take the time to educate yourself and read and learn what's really going on behind the scenes, it's it's a really hard, hard fight. So, you know, one of the things, so I wanted to talk today about just the importance of education and liberation. And I'm gonna talk about what that means exactly. One of the things that I was very fortunate to be able to do is join the professor's new course this semester called Muslims, Race, and Law at the law school. And it's effectively a class about Islamophobia. But, you know, again, interesting, the effect of Islamophobia. We can't really call it a class on Islamophobia because that, you know, brings up all kinds of baggage and, you know, bells and whistles and things like that. So you have to just come out and say, you know, okay, we're talking about Muslims, we're talking about race, we're talking about racism, and we're talking about the law and what that means. And you would think that with everything going on that you would have a full class of people. And, you know, surprisingly, it's a very small number. Why? Because Muslims are afraid to take these classes that have to do with, you know, Islamophobia or, or Muslims. They get asked in their interviews, why are you taking these classes? And so they avoid them altogether. 
And then the perception of a class on Islamophobia taught by a professor who's known as a Sharia apologist, which is again, you know, another one of these, you know, problems. With, I mean, this is again the evil fruit of Islamophobia. Um, you know, people don't want to take a class. It's obviously biased by someone who is a Sharia expert. So, you know, when you're talking about probably the most important thing confronting, you know, Muslims and also us as a community in America dealing with issues of race, this class is something that everyone needs to take, but people by and large don't. But I wanted to share with you, I was amazed by, you know, we're only a few, you know, like partway through the semester, but I have learned so much just about how this has become, you know, Islamophobia is effectively a racial project. And it's something that dates way back before 9-11, where really smart people spent a lot of time, I mean, evil genius really is the appropriate term, figured out, you know, how are we going to pull together resources, get together, create a professional network to make people hate Muslims? And how are we gonna do that? We are going to do that by trying to convince people that Islam is not a religion but it's an ideology. And that Muslims are not adherents to a theology, they're actually a race. So they're like brown you know, Arabs that appear a particular way. And if you wanna see like the impact of this, you can go back and watch, there's a really good movie by Jack Shaheen um, called Real Arabs, R-E-E-L Arabs. And it talks about how the media um, in Hollywood has portrayed people from, you know, um, from Arab and Muslim backgrounds. And all of the different things, all of the messaging, the white nationalist me messaging, all this feeds into certain tropes, ideas, you know, typologies that make people believe that somehow, you know, Muslims are the other. They're brown skinned, they don't, they don't think like us white people or people in the West, they're more backwards. Um, they don't understand democracy, they don't understand reason, you know, oh, they're used to violence, they just like to kill each other. I mean, there are a whole laundry list of things that, you know, Muslims are portrayed as. And it feeds into the narrative that allows things like New Zealand to happen. So it's really important, I mean, that we understand, you know, what is going on. And the, so the top line is this message that Islam is a race, or Muslims are a race, which obviously we know is not true that um, you know, this is a racial project and that you know, we can dehumanize Muslims easily and that somehow the white race is you know, better than Muslims. So that's, that's you know, been really surprising and, and shocking. Um, but once you know that, you know, that's, that's one, one piece of it. Um, so I would say you know, there are a lot of books on Islamophobia that you can read, but you know, if also the professor has been talking a lot about Islamophobia in recent lectures and khutbahs and writings and things like that. So there's a wealth of information that you can start to delve into. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, I wanted to share with you, uh, the other thing is, is the, the Friday khutbahs. So we have started doing the virtual Friday khutbahs every week, which I think has been so powerful. And it's such an easy way to educate yourself because you're only talking about 30 minutes of a week. And, you know, I, um, you know, I was so excited, I've talked about this before, I was so excited when the professor, you know, agreed to do this because I just don't think that there's a place where you can regularly go and understand, you know, what's happening in the world and how should we as Muslims be understanding these things from, you know, the perspective of a scholar and from someone who's really dialed into a lot of different, you know, areas. It's like, um, you know, when you, so to share some themes if you haven't been watching some of these khutbahs, like, you know, the professor was talking about thinking about Islam anew and how, you know, in the Middle East, a lot of the messages that are coming out should be held suspect by Muslims in the West because we see that in the action of some of these countries, you know, these are hypocritical, despotic, you know, oppressive actions. Um, and, you know, it, it just, it, he gave us a way to liberate ourselves from the really ugly messages and start thinking using our native intuition and our own like God-given sense of justice and beauty and love. So, you know, and that was another one. Another khutbah was about how Muslims continue to be colonized and how it's important to understand what that effect is. Another was about how Islamophobia is the new crusade, crusades and we have to recognize that battles now are being fought with information, not with swords and military battles and we're operating at a very different level. You know, these are things that, and then of course yesterday, 
um, understanding you know, the evil fruit of all of this Islamophobia and what happened in New Zealand and how people understand messages and even how shooters like this can come up with very long manifestos that justify killing Muslims. So you know, these are things that even if you just follow along 30 minutes a week, you can learn so much about what's going on in our world. And it can you know, fire you up to make a difference. So what can you do? You know, we've had people write in and say, what can I do? What can I, how can I make a difference? And I would say, you know, you have to look at your own situation and whatever you can do, you should do it. Make this a priority. You have to, you know, if you are a lawyer, start bringing lawsuits, you know, that address like how, how do we deal with domestic terrorism versus how Muslims are dealt with? How do we even use language? You know, lawyers can craft language you know, why is it that Muslims are, are labeled as terrorists and then white nationalists are not? You know, and I think there's a very strong legal component here that can be addressed. If you are not a lawyer, if you have time and you want to get involved, get involved in politics. Get involved in your local community. If you're an educator, you know, teach yourself what is going on and learn how to talk about it. And if you are a public speaker and you're good at public speaking, Get really good at it and teach yourself what needs to be said. And we have to have the, our best and our brightest out there in front. Now, I was really like sad to see, you know, like the professor talked yesterday, and then it was written up in the LA Times, which was great. But they also took a roundup of what other imams around the country were talking about in light of what happened in New Zealand. And I was amazed that one of the people they interviewed said, "Well, you know, I want to." talk about things, I reserve the Friday khutbah for saying things that will uplift the community. So this person decided that they didn't want to talk about New Zealand, which to me was shocking. You know, uplift doesn't mean that you just say nice things to make people feel better. Uplift comes from being truthful and being honest and saying what needs to be said at the appropriate time. And that to me was really upsetting because once again, it's like, listen, we need our best people out there speaking. If you are not the best person speaking, then have the humility to notice that and either make yourself better or step aside and help someone else who has the ability to do it, do it. That's what we need. We are at a crisis point and I don't know how many more people need to be killed, how many people, you know, how many more people need to suffer for Muslims to stand up and I really believe that this is a massive test from God. So, and a few weeks ago, you know, uh, another thing that I think we absolutely have to do is demand more from our Muslim leadership. And we kind of hit on this theme again and again and again. But a few weeks ago, the professor was speaking to a group of Muslim leaders um, at the Islamic Center. And this, you know, it's recorded, it's online, so you can go and see it. And I, I, you know, highly, highly encourage you to watch this. But just some highlights. The professor was sharing, again, the effect of Islamophobia. And I thought it was extremely interesting that he was recounting um, you know, conversations he had with Mayor Hattut 40 years ago. Mayor Hattut was the founder of the Islamic Center of Southern California. And they used to talk about you know, this, this dream of Islam you know, really taking hold in the West. And the professor asked Mayor Hattut, so what if by the time I'm in my 50s, the people that are in the leadership positions at the mosque are still immigrants and not natives? And Mayor Hattut said, then we will have failed. Why? Because our message needs to be convincing to the natives in America so that you know, they want to become Muslims, so that they'll convert, so that they'll see that there's a beautiful message here. And that has not happened because the people that are in charge at mosques are still primarily immigrants. They don't speak English necessarily without an accent. They don't know what it was like to grow up in this culture. They may not know some of the challenges that are confronting like our youth and you know, our young people and they certainly don't know how to address that. So just even that dynamic of having immigrants as opposed to converts you know, in charge at the mosque and really driving how Islam looks in our country is a really important measure of how we're doing you know, in terms of success. And part of that also too is because when immigrants come to America, they are really interested in, you know, their, their focus is how to survive, their focus is how to, you know, how to integrate and how to fit in and not, you know, and not make waves. You know, they want, they have a lot of, of things at stake to fit in to this country. Converts, 
you know, grew up in this country. And they, you know, have rights, they, you know, demand their rights, and they have a completely different outlook. And that's very important for us, you know, in moving forward. We, we can't be about just having people carve out a space and we live peacefully. We have to demand our rights as Americans, and we have to be convincing for, you know, our youth especially. So these were, um, you know, he talked about a lot of really, really interesting things. And I was, you know, so excited because we had a room full of people that they were, you know, in leader, leadership positions throughout Southern California. They were very open. They were very interested. They asked good questions. Um, and then, you know, by the end, you know, it's like, okay, wonderful. You know, this is a good first step. But then shortly thereafter, we started getting emails, you know, of the leaders congratulating each other. This was such a great conference. Thank you so much. You know, it's just, we have to do this every year. You know, we were, it was so great. And then I was like, thinking, okay, well, where are the next steps? What's, what's the action from here? How are we going to address some of these issues that were raised? What are we going to do to change the way we operate? Because look, we know, we all like sat in this room and talked about how scared we are that, you know, our youths are leaving the mosque and leaving Islam, you know, and there were very clear things about what we, what steps we needed to take. You know, we needed to have people who have money step up to the plate and invest, you know, because when you've got people on the other side spending millions upon millions of dollars to feed this Islamophobia industry, and here we are Muslims on this side, barely putting in anything and not even recognizing, like, what the problem is not even knowing the detail of what the problem is. That's a serious problem. You know, I, I, my training is in brand management. I you know, used to work for Johnson & Johnson. When we deal with a product and we sell a product, we take the time to understand what are we selling? Who are we selling it to? How, what's the messaging we're gonna use? What are the promotions? Who are we gonna give you know, like help to to get our, the word out? It's a very complex dynamic. And these people have done it. And they're selling fear of Muslims, and they have succeeded. I mean, they have succeeded. And what have we done? We look at the leadership at our mosques, and we see that the people in charge don't even spend time learning Islam full time. They're business people, they're doctors, they're engineers. You know, they're not. They they try to be scholars, but they can't. They don't. They don't. They haven't spent the time. This is a problem. So we need to demand more of our leaders. We also need to demand more of ourselves. Because, you know, at the same time, I'm getting messages like, okay, Islamophobia is the most important thing. We must have Dr. Abu Fadl teach us Islamophobia. Is this, this is the first time they've heard it. We need him to tell us what to tell our children. We need him to teach us what Islamophobia is. Guess what, people? He's been doing that for over 20 years. He's been sounding the alarm bells. He's been writing. He's been speaking. He's been, like, warning us. You know, we can be here and we can, you know, provide the educational resources. We can do the weekly khutbahs. We can do the lectures, write the books, write the articles. But we ourselves have to actually do the hard work to learn this stuff. You know, we can't just wait for someone, you know, to spoon feed it to us. Come on, people. You know, this is ridiculous. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit disheartening. And then when people hear Dr. Bofalo speak and they get really excited, they're like, yes, this person knows so much. What do they want to do? They want to rush up to him and say, oh my God, brother, that was so great. I have to come meet you. I have to come talk to you. And usually what that means is, let me come tell you my ideas of all the things that you should do. That you as, you know, Dr. Bofalo, oh, you need money? You want someone to do this? Well, maybe you should run a campaign on this. Maybe you should blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what, people? We can't do everything. And I would turn it around and say, okay, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to make a difference? Because this can't fall on just a handful of scholars and a handful of people that are willing to spend all their time doing it. So I'm sorry for the rant because I, um, I'm just, I'm done with it, you know? And the other thing that really makes me sad. So, okay, so March 1st, guys, was my 25th anniversary as a convert. Okay. I don't know what that means other than I mean, it makes me sound old, but <laughs> it means also that I have a lot of stories and a lot of things that I can share. And, you know, I am so passionate and so grateful. I always say, you know, the best gift that God ever gave me was being a Muslim. You know, the, one of the things that the professor said 
at that talk with the Muslim leaders is, you know, he quoted a Quranic verse about how important it is to bring people from darkness to light. And that this is especially what converts have. They know what it feels like to live in that darkness. And they know the light that comes with converting to Islam and finding this beautiful way. So my number one gift was becoming a Muslim, allow God allowing me to be a Muslim. And my number two gift was being married to Dr. Abu Fadl because I was allowed to see things and learn things that most people can't see and learn. And now it's my, my religious duty to give back and share what I've learned and what I've seen. So it's also very painful and very sad when I hear, you know, when people contact me. So a lot of people do write me and they, they struggle. And they say, well, how do I know? How do I know that God is loving? How do I know that God is gonna punish, isn't going to punish me for doing, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, it's it's really hard to fight Islamophobia. It's really hard to, you know, believe and be strong when you haven't taken the time to learn the knowledge and you haven't, like, your relationship with God is not where it should be. And there's no substitute for taking the time to invest in that relationship. And I always tell people, talk to God more, pray more, do the basics. You know, ask God to help you, ask God to guide you. You know, do do what it takes to invest in that relationship because, you know, there's there's no substitute. I mean, here we know that everything sort of begins and ends with your relationship with God. So, um, last piece is just, in terms of this spiritual liberation, so what I, I wanted to share with you a few things that I can, that I, um, was so blessed to learn from Dr. Wolfuddle early on um, in our in our marriage. Things that unlocked for me that box that Wahhabis often lock all of us in, that oppressive box that tells you not to think and not to ask questions and holds you in that place where you're just in fear that maybe you're doing something wrong and that God's gonna punish you and all of that. So one of the very first things was there's no embarrassment in religion. Everything can be scrutinized and should be scrutinized to your satisfaction. You should feel free to ask any question you want. There is nothing off limits. And that is spiritual liberation. Because what I've learned and from this library and from what I've seen with you know, the professor and being a convert for 25 years is this tradition is so rich. You will find you know, opinions on every side of every issue. And that to me says that it's not clear cut that we don't need to live in a box, and that you, if you do the requisite work, you find the scholar that represents beauty and knowledge to you, and for me, that's Dr. Abufadl. You know, you seek that person out, you seek out that knowledge, you read what they've written, that is a huge liberation for you. And short of that, if you, know, if you are not comfortable with that, then just use what's in your intuition that God gave you, your own sense of what's beautiful and what's just, and let that guide you until you find something better. Um, you know, and so and another thing that the professor has written about, and you know, in this book, Search for Beauty, which I always recommend, is the fundamental question. Is it beautiful? Is it reasonable? Is it loving? Is this the best we can do? You know, if God wants us to be the best, is this the best that we can do? And lastly, um, the idea that God loves you more than your own mother. Like, if you think about this, you know, oftentimes I'll think about, like, okay, so if I asked, if I did something and my mother was angry at me, or a mother figure, maybe, you know, you don't have a good relationship with your mother, but you have a mother figure. If you did something and that person who really loved you, you know, would they forgive me? And most times I think they would because they love me. And it's like, God is infinitely more loving than that. And that's like a beautiful idea to just reflect upon. And what does that really mean? Because if you know you can deal, you can think about your own mother, but it's a little harder sometimes to think about you know God a little bit further out there. But um, that's like the beginning of thinking about you know is God a loving God, and what would God allow for me? And I'll close with this sort of example that kind of pulls all of this together. So someone contacted me um, recently because she wanted to know if it was okay to pray when you're on your period. And so again, this is not, you know, people don't enjoy talking about women on their periods. So let's just, you know, make the point that nothing is, you know, there's no embarrassment in religion. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that. Um, and I told her, well, you know, this was one of these things that I talked to, to the professor about early on in our marriage. Because to me, a lot of times, 
I didn't like this idea that, okay, well, I, you know, like, where did this come from that I would stop? You know, it was always told to me, well, you know, women don't have to pray when they're on their period because then, you know, you're on break and it's really difficult and so it's kind of a blessing for you. And I was saying to myself, yeah, but I do a lot of stuff that's a lot harder than prayer, you know, when I'm, when I'm on my period. So that's kind of strange. It didn't quite sit well with me. And then I asked the professor and he said, well, you know, that comes from this Jewish law tradition that sort of assumes that women are dirty. You know, and so it's the same thing, that women can't touch the Quran, they can't enter mosques, they can't, you know, whatever, when they're on their period. And, you know, and I was like, well, you know, I don't buy that. I don't think that women are dirty or somehow, you know, lesser because they're on their period. And so, you know, I said, well, what if I want to pray all the time and I don't want to stop? And he said, that's fine. It's between you and God. And so I shared this with my friend, and I, for the vast majority of my, you know, of my time after that, I would always pray. I would just continue to pray whether I was on my period or not. But this is not one of these things that he wrote about. It's not one of these things that, you know, is, you know, in our current context with Muslims that you would write about or talk about easily because it is an uncomfortable topic. And so I kind of kept it to myself and if it would ever come up and people would ask me, then I would share it in my opinion. And this is my opinion. So it's not like this is what God has said. It's like this is, in my opinion, what is comfortable in my intuition. I don't believe that God thinks of me as a dirty human being. And I think that if I want to pray during my period, I just pray that God will accept it. So when I told her this, she said, yeah, but you know what? I did a search on the internet and there's like no opinion. I just, I wanna read more. I wanna know more. I wanna understand more because I've always been told that God will punish me if I pray when I'm on my period. And I'm like, why would God punish you? God is loving. But I just, I'm not sure. I just don't, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I want to pray. So she actually wanted to pray. She's like, I have a feeling like I want to pray. You know, and I've always learned from the professor that, you know, if you feel that sense that you want to pray, that's God opening up to you. Go pray. You feel like you want to read the Quran, go do it. You know, that's that's a, a, an opportunity for you to connect. She's like, no, but I really can't. And so, you know, I had to go through, like, a lot of back and forth with her about, well, you know, listen, I mean, think of this example. If your child wanted to reach out to you in love, but was covered in blood, would you deny that your child? Well, no, of course not. Okay, and God loves you more than your mother. So let's think about that. You know, I'm not like making a fatwa or a legal pronouncement, because obviously I'm not able to do that. But I feel comfortable in my heart that I can believe that God is loving and would accept that from me. So it's just an example of how me as a single person trying to find my way, thinking of God in a loving way, exercise my intuition, consulted my shaykh, and felt at peace, quite frankly. I like having a constant connection, whether I'm on my period or not. So, sorry to end with a kind of uncomfortable story, but I hope that, you know. Okay, good. Thank you. For some people it is. For yeah, some people it is, yeah. you know, but I think that it's important to, you know, this is this is no, no more important thing than your relationship with God, and I think that, you know, we should feel free, you know, as the professor has said in his book, this is the time for us to stand up and define our beautiful faith and what that means, and I think as individual Muslims, you know, think about why are you part of this? Sorry, and last thing I actually wanted to say was, so at the very end of this, this leadership conference where the professor spoke, I got sort of irritated because someone was talking about Muslim identity and how important it is to do this. And I said, you know, like, being Muslim is not an identity, like what you look like, you know, where you come from. It's a conviction. It's what you believe in what you do. It's how you, you know, act. It's what you do in a difficult situation. And I really want to, like, move us beyond this idea, like, you know, there's a certain look or a race or a you know identity or something like that because we are what we do and that's what we're going to be held accountable for and I hope that that's the message that we can impart here through our work at the Sweden Institute you know we try to give people a methodology and a way of thinking we give you tools but you know it's up to us as Muslims then to put those tools into play and try and get to the right outcome so thank you thank you okay.
uh, feeling a little bit unwell because it's been a very uh, exhausting week and I've just been working a ridiculous amount of hours and um, So before we start uh, the Tafsir, uh, Surah Zalzala, uh, a couple of things. Um, since Grace brought up the issue of uh, women prayer during the menstrual cycle, uh, the, the issue of, of Allah <coughs> being disgusted by women during that period is completely unsupported and, and without foundation. It's, that's an entire invention, regardless of of, uh, of how some people imagine that to be part of the... The, the real issue is simply tahara, whether a person at that time uh, and and the real issue is whether Allah accepts a prayer or not. And I normally don't talk about this issue in public um, because I realize that it's one of those questions that Muslims have big hang-ups on about. Uh, it's just part of the historical moment that Muslims tend to, on anything involving women, uh, they see that as a front line of uh, the battlegrounds of identity. And that's a part of just uh, the, the legacy of patriarchal structure that you, you become very emotional when it comes to things um, involving women and you, you tend to see it in terms that are much larger than simply a question of jurisprudence. But the, all I'm going to say about this um, is that Stefti Kolba, Kolo of Tau, Kolo of Tau, Kolo of Tau, you know, ultimately it is what is in your heart. As long as you renew your wudu before each prayer, especially if there is a flow, um, then, and, and you pray, it is between you and Allah whether you believe that Allah will accept your prayer or not. And it is not for me to tell a woman that wants to pray during that time, no, you can't pray. That, that's just, that, that's a, something that takes a great deal of, it, it, it's like uh, we said before uh, in, in one of the khutbahs that a person who comes, who intervenes to sever ties between Allah and a human being is like a highway robber. And I cannot be a highway robber. If someone has that connection with Allah, far be it for me to say, no, you, uh, you know, you, you can, you can, you can tell them what the jurisprudence is. You can tell them what the opinions are. You bet. Ultimately, it's between them and Allah. Um, that's all I'm going to say about this this issue because, I, uh, you know, I, people get very irrational and heated, you know, like the hijab issue, uh, they're just, uh, on, on the, the other thing, um, you know, the, the, um, what Grace was saying about Islamophobia, I mean, it, it, it is, it is a, project of subordination that has been ongoing in Europe 
through the Crusades. I mean, Europe has seen Muslims in racialized terms throughout history. They, they have had a very hard time within the cultural legacy of Europe of admitting Islam as a faith. Um, uh, somewhat similar to, to the problem they had with Jews, where Jews becomes become racialized somewhat similar because it's a different dynamic uh, and the Jewish faith especially after the Holocaust is is accepted as a faith although it is racialized at the same time but in different ways they're they're, they're seen as ultimately as part of the white legacy and the white culture Muslims are very different. Muslims were never seen as part of the white legacy and white culture. Um, and they were always imagined to be Berbers or Moors or Saracens or Turks or Arabs. They were, they were always imagined as a racial category. And when <clears throat> Europe would come to terms with Islam as a religion rather than a race, they would insist that Islam either is a corruption of Christianity, that it basically um, uh, it was an attempt to plagiarize the Bible that went, that, that is just a, a reduction or a reductionist product of uh, Christianity. So like a heresy, basically, a Christian heresy. Or they would see Islam as a demonic revelation, basically the the product of uh, a demonic intervention with the prophet, who of course they don't see as a prophet. Um, but uh, there's a very very long story. I mean, it, uh, it Muslims <coughs> existed in very large numbers in South America, in Brazil, in Central America, in the 17th century. There was a ma major Muslim rebellions in Brazil. There's a very famous Muslim re rebellion in, in Brazil that was took place in the 1700s. Um, Muslims um, in the U.S., there were about a million uh, slave, uh, Muslims who were slaves. And the, the practice of Islam was outlawed by various state laws. Um, Friday congregations were banned, and fasting Ramadan was banned. Uh, the, the Muslim population was forcibly eventually uh, converted to Christianity, but it also led to, in the United States, a ban against Muslims becoming citizens of the U.S. that lasted for about 150 years. Um, Europe even had a harder time than than the U.S. in ex the idea of accepting Muslim citizenship. Uh, th there were, by the way, major Muslim existences in the United States in the early 1900s, in the 1930s, in the 1960s, and uh, each wave becomes eventually um, absorbed and dissipates. And so there's a lot to learn from history. And one of the most frustrating things for me is that uh, Muslims, um, and, and I'm talking about those who call themselves Muslim leaders, um, uh, they, they are not in the habit of even reading good research that is out there because there are a few very good works out there about the history of Islam in the United States, the history of Islam in South America and Central America, the history of Islam um, uh, during the, um, the colonial era in, very, in various parts of Europe. Um, 
And there is a great deal that if you are engaged in, in, in the public arena, there is a great deal to learn and to benefit from by studying the dynamics of interacting with Muslims and what the problems of the past and how they repeat themselves. There were even lynchings, by the way, of Muslims in the 1930s. There were Muslims, not, not even slaves, not blacks, but Muslims who were Turks, Muslims who were Arab. There was a, a, a famous lynching of a poor Yemeni guy, another lynching of a Lebanese guy. There was a, so we even don't know the history of lynchings of Muslims of, in, in the U.S. That, um, that took place in the 1930s. And, 19, and most Muslims are shocked when you tell them that there were lynchings, public lynchings of Muslims. Um, so, Islamophobia, the Islamophobia industry doesn't come out of a vacuum. It's, it's not an entirely uh, unrooted invention. It's, a, it's an industry that tapped into an already existing cultural heritage. And the most critical thing the most critical thing is that it is an industry where people partly took advantage of existing tax laws uh, because the, 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 the donations, the, the, the funding for Islamophobic work is tax deductible for the most part. And, um, and tapped into that culture of crusading against Islam. And the thing that I, I keep saying, and I've been saying for about 20, 30 years now, is that it is just simple logic, people. And you, you know this from business, and you know this from law. If you have one side of a lawsuit where someone spends a million dollars and the other side of the lawsuit someone spends a hundred dollars you know well anyone that has any experience in the legal field will tell you you know the, the results are rather predictable you you can't it, it can't work that way and you know that in business if someone spends a million dollars on marketing and another person spends a hundred dollars on marketing, you know who's going to sell more. So just pure math, simple mathematics, if you compare the amount of money that Islamophobes have invested in their product project, and you compare it with the amount of money that Muslims have invested in countering that project, it is so unequal that it, it just, uh, it, 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 it's, um, the, the, the results and the consequences are obvious. I mean, it's not like we are trying and failing. We are not even trying. And that, that is just a, a, a um, I mean, when you imagine that at the same, the same people who at, uh, uh, who instituted the Muslim ban, in dealing with Muslims, they found no blowback, even in moving the American embassy uh, to Jerusalem, no blowback. They visited the Muslim world, they were welcomed by the Muslim world, they were even rewarded by very hefty contracts. Um, so the, the external world, as far as Muslims are uh, living in the West are concerned, the consequences from coming from Muslim, quote unquote, Muslim countries, um, don't help Muslims in the West. So Muslims in the West are truly on their own. They're standing alone. Which means that, you know, it's one of those historical moments where either you come to terms with the realities of history, or you risk the same fate 
that have befallen Muslims in Brazil in the 1970s, befallen Muslims in Suriname, because there was a very huge Muslim population in Suriname, in, Su in South America. Um, same thing, uh, Muslims in Panama, Muslims in Trinidad, Muslims in Tobago, Muslims in Florida. There was a major Muslim rebellion in Florida, um, a very famous rebellion that uh, in the 1800s and 1830s. Um, the same fate of Muslims from various Muslim countries in the early 20th century and then the 1930s and then the 1960s. And it's the same repeated cycle of the, the same exact accusations that Europe has been repeating about Islam and Muslims centuries ago are not any different. They're the same, it's the same amount of garbage. So I'll, I'll give you just one quick example. Attacking the Quran has been one of the favorite responses of Europe and Orientalism to Islam. And attacks on the Quran, the legitimacy of the Quran, the integrity of the Quran, the uniqueness of the Quran, is a very, very old story. Interestingly, Muslims have responded to these attacks centuries ago. And the responses by Muslims centuries ago are far more eloquent and far more thorough than the responses, that any responses I've seen by any Muslims in the modern age. With the explosion of Orientalism, part of the colonial project is to colonize Muslim countries, you needed natives to participate in the colonial project. You cannot occupy a foreign country without getting people to work with you from within the domestic context. So when <coughs> Britain and France and Holland and Italy colonized Muslim countries, part of what they did was the Orientalist project. And that's a very big topic, but in a nutshell, they produced a wave of scholarship, in quotes, in order to get locals, natives, to lose enough confidence in the in self-determination and autonomy so that Muslims doubt the integrity of their own being and work with the with colonial powers to better effectuate colonialism. The same thing, by the way, is happening now with the occupation in Iraq and the occupation in Afghanistan and all the military bases around the world. You need Muslims to work with you. And you can't have Muslims that have a powerful sense of identity and a powerful sense of self-determination and autonomy and self-respect. You need Muslims who are in a state of self-doubt about the self to work with the, with the occupier, with the foreign presence, and to work with the foreign existence as, as a gratitude, in, in the sense that you're saying to uh, American imperialism, you know, we're very grateful that you're here. And that type of, that has even affected the, the ruling class in the Emirat, it has affected the ruling class in Saudi Arabia because they were all educated in the West. That's where they got the, the, their Orientalist consciousness and their Oriental and their Islamophobic consciousness. It has affected the ruling class in Egypt because all the rich, corrupt military and security forces send their kids to be educated in the West. And when they come to the West, what they learn is the material that we're talking about. 
And it's like a fact. I am noticing these days that Islamophobia, before Islamophobia, Orientalism. And before Orientalism, the, the, the propaganda of the Crusades. The same old tropes about doubt, casting doubt in the hearts of Muslims about the Quran, I, I am seeing all over again. And among those, and among those, so just we're all, so part of the reason I hold these halakas is education, to try to educate people. And among those is the old idea, the old trope, that the Quran was not really that unique, that pre-Islamic Arabia had poetry and texts and narratives that were very similar to the Quran and that it is Muslims who basically hid these, these brilliant narratives that competed with the eloquence of the Quran. So the, the, the argument usually goes, and again, it's a very old, very redundant, very, uh, that, there were there, the, the pre-Islamic Arabs used to do sajra, used to do uh, rhymed poetry, and this rhymed poetry was so close to the Quran that the Quran even plagiarized that that old pre-Islamic poetry, and so not just plagiarized the Bible because they can't make up their mind. Plagiarize the Bible, plagiarize the Torah, plagiarize pre-Islamic poetry plagiarized and and I've seen among Saudis uh, young gener uh, young uh, Saudis the the, com the upcoming generation there's a lot of atheism and uh, I've seen it among young Egyptians a lot of atheism and they say they, they got that same stuff oh well you know isn't it true that there were you know uh, that the Arabs were re repeating the Saj as similar to similar to <coughs> It's this surah and this surah and similar to that surah, and I've now and I've seen it among Iranians with the spread of atheism. Well, you know, wasn't there was pre-Islamic poetry in Persia that was like this surah and like this surah and like this surah, and it spreads like wildfire. Now the amazing thing is that centuries ago. That same garbage was floating around, and Muslim scholars wrote volumes responding to it. And we are completely oblivious to, to the how absurd these claims and the idea that someone becomes an atheist or, or has doubts about their faith because of this, this garbage. And the reason I say garbage is <laughs> Arabs at the time of the Islamic revelation, they were masters of the Arabic language. Islam would have never taken hold if the Quran was not truly unique. If the Quran resembled anything, it, there is no way that it would have been preserved. We, the, the pre-Islamic poetry, because the, when you get down to, to, to the nitty gritty details and you actually examine this pre-Islamic poetry, I can tell you, and I've read tons of it, tons, none of it even comes close to what the Quran is like. And that's why the Quran itself, when it told people, you say that this is not from God, when it tells pre-Islamic <clears throat> Arabs. So come up with a surah like it. So when you read people, when, when you, when you, you know, these little punks, and I say punks because they're usually young, <laughs> you know, kids in their 20s, arrogant, and when you told them, okay, what is this pre-Islamic poetry that you came? Well, I'm not sure. Someone told me. Well, I read it on a website somewhere. Well, but point me to an actual text so I can give you an actual response. 
same thing. And it's amazing that you find it spreading, you know, in Saudi, in Iran, in Bahrain, in in the Emirates, in Egypt, in, in, all at the same time, like a wave. And Muslims are so ill-educated that immediately they restart, start responding. You know, they, 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 it's as if the, the amount of exposure tells you that there is a coordinated marketing effort to reach very widely because the exposure is amazing. And especially when we've had these same precise arguments made by German Orientalists in the 1800s and were, were abandoned as implausible a long time ago and then now they are coming back simply because Ibn Warraq republished the articles of German Orientalists and French Orientalists and then people don't even read the, the articles by these Orientalists. They, they, what floats around is a highly um, uh, false, reductionist version of even the arguments of the Orientalists. You know, to me, it's very, because Grace brought this up, it's very frustrating when, pe when, when people say, well, what do we do, what do we do, and something like the Osudi Institute, and we, we, we've been around now for a year, okay. more than a year, and we, when you compare the amount, the size of the problem, and I can tell you, the Osudi Institute is very, very, very underfunded. There's very little funding for all the, 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 the messages that we get and so on. And I, and I intentionally, to try to keep my inner peace, you know, I, I try not to ask too many questions because it gets very uh, discouraging. Um, you know, the, something like the mortgage on this house, we continue to pay. We, you know, all the dreams of having postdocs and having researchers and having a, 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 a system, you know, it, it's all held up because there's no funding. There's no one has come through and said, you know, okay, well, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. And so it, it continues to be. SubhanAllah, I mean, it, it's true, true the, it, it, as the Qur'an uh, 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 identifies and diagnoses it, it is an issue of infaq fi sabilillah. Who, who spends in the way of Allah and who doesn't? If your enemy is, is spending all this money to destroy you, and you are not, you know, leave all the rhetoric aside, all the, you know, I, at this point, I have become so, um, instead of sitting there wasting time pontificating about things that you, you know, on the net, which in the net is sort of demonic, I have to tell you, it's just, it really is a time sink and it is an intellectual uh, vampire. Um, go make money and donate it. You want to know how to be useful? Go make money and donate it. That is much better than all the intellectual intellectualizing that you are not doing properly. And I'm not talking to, not to people here. I'm talking to people uh, who will hear me because the, the, these recordings seem to go all over the place. Yeah. Unless we are put, willing to put our resources where our mouth and our claims are, Allah will never change our situation. One thing I didn't say in my khutbah, because I thought it would be too harsh and because I knew journalists were there. I intended to say that once I walked in and I found LA Times journalists and all the media there, I decided not to say it. The blood of Muslims were killed in France, killed in Canada, killed, killed in Britain, and then now killed in New Zealand. We, part of their blood is in our own hands. 
because as long as Islamophobia continues to go on and we are not countering it properly, as long as we continue to counter Islamophobia with our extracurricular on the weekend, you know, board of directors, people in mosques, such and such person who is an engineer or is a medical doctor or whatever does, you know, this on the side and the board of directors and then goes, does an interview in front of a camera and, you know, and, and pontificates about it. So as long as this is our response, then the blood of the victims is on our hands. And I'm serious about this. As harsh as this sounds, you want to respond Effectively, you do things the proper way within the epistemological paradigm of your day and age. This day and age is the age of specialization and professionalism. There are scholars who specialize in that, that can tell you the entire story about every single accusation made by Islamophobes including something like Islam is an ideology, is not a religion, because that's very old. That was raised from since the beginning of the 20th century. There are scholars of race. There are scholars of communication. There are scholars of marketing. There are anthropologists. There are sociologists. There are political scientists. And if there is funding, you could have a, an, an even funding for Muslim politicians because the Emirates and Saudi are spending money to take down the two Muslims that we have in Congress. <laughs> and I can tell you the amount of money that, they, that, we, that is available for Muslims to run for elections is extremely limited. So, you know, as much as I appreciate people coming after the khutbah and telling me, oh, thank you, brother, this was wonderful, and so on, every time a Muslim says, I want to meet with you, I have to come to your office and talk to you. You know, I, I don't want to be rude, because it, Allah tells me not to be rude. You know, but I, the devil tempts me, shaitan tempts me to say, okay, I'll meet with you if you pay my hourly fee. You should. Which is $600 at six fifty at this point. But of course I'm not going to say that. You know, but if you don't want to pay it, then donate it. Okay. I'll meet with you if you donate 650 to to an Islamic cause. Yeah. And I'm, I'll actually dedicate my time 10 hours a week meeting with people if the, instead, if the money goes to countering Islamophobia. But, but show me the check so I know I actually did it. <laughs> what do I say? I mean, it, it is... When it, it, the man that... The, 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 no, do we know anything about the, the other than the one attacker, the guy who wrote the manifesto? No. I mean, this in itself requires... Imagine if, these, if this was an attack committed by Muslims with 50 casualties. Imagine how many talking heads would have been invited to media everywhere and sitting there and talking about the Islamic threat, Islamic and political <coughs> Islam, Islamic extremism, Islamic fanaticism. Okay, this attack happened. How many media outlets do you think invited Muslims to come in to talk about the threat to Muslims from violence? It's extremely unequal. And the media will not invite you to come speak unless they're pressured. And, and, and they're not pressured unless they, they, they know it's going to affect their bottom line. There are ways to influence outlets like CNN to dedicate airtime, but it has to be done professionally. It cannot be done 
by the, the, the imam in a mosque that does, you know, goes to, to the center on the weekend and sits there and shoots from the hip. There are way to, ways, professional ways to do things. This is, this is part of the racialization that Grace was talking about, is that when something happens against, that threatens white privilege, the entire society reacts. When something happens to those outside the mainstream, it is exceptionalized and justified as an, it, as, as a, an outlier to the norm. So it's not that there is a systematic problem of Islamophobia, but that this is somehow just a, 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 someone who's gone bad. I can tell you, I mean, I just want to tell you the, in, in, from the, this guy, and it's obvious that this is an organization. It's obvious that he had, because he says that he trained for two years and um, trained for two months in New Zealand before the attack. So, and it's obvious that the, the weapons he got, that he had, there's an entire organization behind him, and yet not New Zealand, not Australia, not Britain, and not the US is telling us anything about who's the, the organization. If this was an attack committed by Muslims, you bet we would have been hearing all types of things about who's behind it and who's part of it and so on. But among the things he says, and I, I'm not, I, you know, Allah alam if he's, if he's truthful or not. But it just struck me that not even a peep in the media about this, not even a single word. And if the khutbahs of the Islamic Center were longer, I would have talked about this. He says, uh, I'll have you know, I graduated top of my class in Navy SEALs. And I've been involved in numerous secret trades on Al-Qaeda. And I have over 300 confirmed kills. I'm trained in guerrilla warfare and I'm a top sniper in the U.S. Armed Forces. He goes on to say, you are nothing to me but just another target, I'll wipe your effing blah, 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 out with the precision, the likes of which you have never seen before. Mark my effing words. You think you can get blah, 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 and he goes on. So, yeah, so he claims that he's actually been trained, that he's military. I haven't heard a single thing. He writes this in his manifesto. It's significant if, because I can tell you the military, ex-military, are an increasing problem or the, 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 pres the existence of white supremacist groups in the military is a serious problem. And especially when the President of the United States says, I have supported the military, I have supported armed and, and police enforcement, and, you know, they'll raise hell if something happens to me. We are talking about a real threat. And for one, for all these great journalists out there, I would like to know. Because if you're doing correct journalism, you would tell us whether this guy is lying or not. Another thing, by the way, he says in his manifesto that the people he hates the most are converts. Oh, Lord. So, the white converts. Oh. Well, he doesn't say white converts. I mean, he doesn't want racist people. I don't think he cares about. Yeah, no one cares white. about black people. Yeah, or. So he says, he, yeah. he doesn't. He says, the only Muslim I truly hate is the convert. Those from our own people that turn their backs on their heritage, no. turn their backs on their cultures, turn their back on their traditions, and become blood traitors to their, to their own race. Actually, their own race, their so, own race. yeah. These I hate. So. Um, he, he says in there that if, um, that if he had his way, every convert would be put to death. Um, he also says that he believes that he will be released from prison in 30 years and that white civilization will hold him and people like him as, as heroes. Um, 
in the attack, he had, if you noticed, he had uh, writing all over his guns. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's written the names of other attackers from all over the world. So it's obvious he's, there's a lot of research. He knows the names of people who attacked and killed Muslims everywhere. And he's memorizing their names um, on the guns. And then um, the other thing I, I, I didn't read in the khutbah, um, which caught my attention, I thought was very interesting. He said, he, this is, he's talking about how we, we should propagate the war against Muslims. So then he's telling it, uh, the people who read this, place posters near public parks calling for Sharia law. Then in the next week, place posters over those posters, the ones calling for Sharia law, calling for the expulsion of all immigrants. Repeat in every area of public life until a crisis emerges. It, it, it's, it's very consistent with tactics that, he, that have been used in university campuses where we suddenly see posters, anti-Semitic posters popping up. We suddenly see very radical sounding posters popping up. And then we find an entire crisis about Sharia threat and the threat of Muslim radicalization of university campuses emerging, even forcing presidents of universities to condemn the posters that the MSA usually says, we didn't put up. We don't know who's responsible for these posters. And it just took me right away when I read this. What an admission. I, I don't know when Muslims are going to wake up. I mean, I'm, inshallah, we're supposed to go to Princeton. And my brother was asking a big, there's a big, another, as if we need another huge mosque. There was another huge mosque that cost millions of dollars that was, was built in Princeton, about five minutes away from another mosque, a huge mosque, also in the Princeton area. Anyway, so he was asking whether uh, um, they wanted me to give the, the khutbah at Jummah or not. We couldn't even get a response to that. We never heard back. I don't know what it will take for Muslims to get that wake-up call and, and, and realize the blood on their hands. Okay, whether you realize it or not, this is actually a perfect introduction to Surah Al-Zalzala <laughs> because Surah Al-Zalzala will confirm the idea very powerfully of the idea of blood, the, the idea of blood on your hands, on our, all our hands. Because we will all see the ultimate and entire consequences of our actions and decisions, or lack of decisions, or inactions in the final, in the hereafter. So, first, it's another surah where there are various reports about whether this is a surah that was revealed in Mecca or whether it was revealed in Medina. Most, the majority opinion is that it was revealed in Mecca, although there are some important um, narratives that no, it's a Medinian revelation. Um, Amanda, you, you, you have the, you want to read the translation? Sure. Okay. In the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. When the earth is shaken violently in its last quaking, when the earth throws out its burdens, when man cries, what is happening to it? 
On that day it will tell all, because your Lord will inspire it. On that day, people will come forward in separate groups to be shown their deeds. Whoever does an Adam's weight of good will see it, but whoever does an Adam's weight of evil will see that. Okay, so, if there's a thing like an object in Zimzalah... That our community is like the human body. Sorry. So... Zilzan is the, is the, the violent shaking. And by the way, the, the Zilzan in, in Arabic could also describe a violent shaking of the soul. Uh, and, and that is why the, the Quran specifies that it, it is a al ard. So if the earth, it's when the earth itself, and either here is per the meaning of when, not if, which, anyway, I don't want to get into the, um, uh, but consistently in, in the Quran, consistently Allah informs us about an eventual transformation of the nature of reality itself. It is clear that the transformation of the nature of reality will come through. It, 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 it will be a momentous, um, disturbing event. So, whether in, in elsewhere, of course, in the Quran, if you remember. Uh, if you remember when Allah describes the mountains becoming and Manfush, it becomes like threaded fiber, which we talked about in Art of Sea. Or when Allah talks about the mountains becoming like Haba and Mansura, the mountains will become as if it become vaporized. Or when Allah says that the Ard will become Ghayr al Ard, that the, the, the earth will become something other than the earth. And it's, it's quite remarkable. It's as if Allah is telling us what it will become is something you have not experienced in your reality. So there, there is no frame of reference. For, for Allah to describe to us that transformation in reality, other than to say that the mountains will become as if threaded fiber, that mountains will vaporize, or that the earth will shake. And here, in Zilzila Zilzalaha, it will shake, literally in Arabic, it's shaking. That, in, 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 uh, in Balagha, it's the inevitability of the occurrence of the event. So that this is coded into the fate of the earth itself. It is something that is weaved in the fiber of creation that will come to pass. Before I get to Akhrajat al Ardu Athkalaha and the earth will, 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 what was the second verse to how did he translate it? When the earth throws out its burdens. Okay, throws out its burdens. al Ardu Before I get to that, I'm going to skip to verse 3. Waqal al Insan Umala. And people will wonder what's happening or will ask what's happening. Now, there is a lot written about that, and, and a lot of it has to do with the eloquence of the Arabic itself. But that moment of transformation, that violent shaking, this vaporizing of reality, is so shocking that elsewhere the Quran tells us that at this moment, even if those who are pregnant will, uh, will lose their pregnancies, that those who 
or it, it will be an overwhelming moment. And at the same time, the Quran repeatedly elsewhere assures us that those who are in Allah's grace are the people who will be comforted at this moment. So it's a moment of gripping anxiety and gripping fear without the comfort that follows or without the assurance of a comfort unless you are in Allah's grace. Now, if you're forward thinking, and this is the entire Islamic message, is that if you are unable to think of anything beyond the life the material existence, the physical existence in this world, then you are, to one extent or another, oblivious to the coming of this moment. And partly because, and, and the Quranic commentaries are rather consistent on this, is because so many people are in a, in a state of doubt about the coming of the hereafter, the coming of the end, the coming of this moment of transformation, that their reaction, their initial reaction to the natural calamities that will unfold is simply to wonder what you would expect them to wonder. What's going on? That's the qalan insanu mana. That human beings will respond by saying, what is in our language is what the heck is going on? It will initially come about appearing as a, a, just another court run of the, the, the mill natural disaster, but it will become very clear that this is no run of the mill event, that the very fabric of reality in itself is changing. And I'll explain in a second why this is important. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, Allah says, uh, that the, the, the earth itself, to badda means it will be thoroughly changed. And it will become something else other than the earth. Now, because we have no frame of reference, and what we are empirically, experientially based human creatures, whatever we understand in our existence that we have not experienced requires either a higher intellect or a higher spirit. In the absence of a higher intellect, so for a higher intellect, for instance, allows you to do abstract mathematics, things that you have not experienced but you can calculate. A higher spirit allows you to experience or to imagine or to feel things beyond what you materially ex experienced in life. But because our consciousness, for the most part, is constructed by what we've experienced. This is why consistently the Quran references, whether the Quran calls it Zalzala or calls it Al Haqqa or um, um, uh, I'm blanking out. Um, the, 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 it, will, will, it will come to me, inshallah. But there are various references to that moment. All the words, when you collate them and compile the various ways that the Quran describes that momentous transformative event, connote an, a complete change in the nature of reality itself. OK. so. Yawma is to haddith to akhbaraha. Can you, Amanda, can you remind me, the, 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 this is verse number two. What's the translation again? When the earth throws out its burdens. Um, the one after that. 
when man cries, what is happening to it? Yeah, the one after that. On that day, it will tell all. Okay. Tell all. A very interesting translation. Yawma izin tuhaddis wa khamara. Tuhaddis in Arabic to feed on istinas. A tahdis is to communicate literally to chat. And normally when we use haddatha to feed the istinas means that it is comforting talk. Now, we have very interesting tension here, quite intentional, and part of the, the, the balagat of the Qur'an, the eloquence of the Qur'an. It is, at this moment, there is no istinas, there is no comfort, because we just been told about how jarring the transformative moment is. And that uh, it, 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 reality itself is changing. Some of the most, the most beautiful, and again, because if we, if we, in, in, in we talk about the Arabic grammar, all the, you know, we miss out uh, always uh, when we go. That. And istinas here. That do you know where the where where the element of comfort that again remember, hadatha means to like chat like your grandmother talking to you. We call that tahdith. Like or you you would talk to your child. That's tahdith. Do you know where the comfort is coming from or that that warm talk is coming from? It's not from the earth to human beings is from the earth to Allah. That the earth, it's as if the earth will be chatting with Allah, complaining to Allah about all that has transpired on top of it or in it. Which is one of the most beautiful images now, if you read in Tafsir, you find some odd traditions. One that says Allah will turn the earth into an animal that will speak to God in the final day. You know, you can, it's baseless. Uh, the only place that I've seen uh, some odd modern sources, that, literal sources, what usually what we call Wahhabi type sources. Uh, have preserved, but that tradition is groundless. Uh, it, the earth will not turn into an animal that will talk to Allah. The, 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 the earth will turn into a reality that will complain to Allah. However, here comes when we, Allah says, oh, um, Looking up, sorry. Um, when the earth emits literally, would emit its burdens. And the question here emit its burdens how? Now, all, we, we all remember that we do these, these you know, the. the um, at the first tier or the first layer is the resurrection. Whatever has been deposited in this earth, whether it's ashes or dust, whether it becomes ashes or dust, in very much, and then if you read in the Tafasir, they talk at length about how out of a, a seed grows an entire tree Similarly, out of the nucleus of the smallest things, the resurrection, of course today we know about DNA, so you know, yeah. we get even logic through it. That, but uh, SubhanAllah, I mean, centuries ago, when, when Muslims were thinking about, well, how could from the most small atom something be recreated again? 
without knowledge of the DNA, they, they would have to rely on their imagination. It's closer to us, for us to imagine it. But at the first level is for, for, for the, all that has existed. Now, there is a very interesting debate in Islamic sources as to whether animals are resurrected as well as human beings, but animals without accountability. Um, again, I'll pass over that debate because it, it mattered to them theologically because they used to take their, 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 their faith, I think, much more seriously than we did. We do. But uh, everyone agrees that resurrection will be for all human beings and that all human beings resurrected will, will emerge in ashtat, in, in, in groups and congregations. So, that, and that's the, the, the um, uh, what we, we um, the first year. Okay. وَأَخْرَجَتُ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا has another meaning that is talked about extensively. That all that had transpired on this earth will be exposed and revealed within the consciousness of those that come resurrected. So, and this is necessary to see the full consequences of actions. And this mattered a great deal to Muslim theologians. You can't know the consequences of the who did what in the past. You can't have true accountability Unless you see, and so even they, when, they, when they exemplify it in concrete terms, they say, if someone spilled someone's blood, you cannot know the consequences of spilling and taking someone's soul that reverberated through creation for generations to come unless with instantaneously within your consciousness you see everything that led to it and everything that followed from it. And that وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالِهَا doesn't just mean that the earth and, and some said well the resurrection happens just without necessarily that being a weight upon the thiqal means something that has weight. And say, well, you know, resurrection can happen without that being the earth getting rid of its weight because there's no real weight. So they said it has a figurative meaning. So when you were carrying a story that you, you can't tell people about, you say, thakunat alayya zakira that I have a memory that's weighing heavy on me, okay? So when the, you say, that the earth will alleviate itself or will re release of itself of its secrets and its memories. It's literally as if what a, a, a painting is being drawn for the transformation of reality in itself through the shaking, intense, and zelzala, remember, it doesn't have, it's, it's, it's zelzala, ghayru zelzal. Zelzal is an earthquake. Zelzala is an intense shaking that continues in time and that tra is transformative in nature. And so, That transformation of reality produces the, that whether you want to take it literally, literally or figuratively, that, that all that has transpired on earth will become obvious and apparent. And the secrets and realities 
of all that human beings have done. So another common image that they talk about when they discuss Surah Al-Zalzala, which some have, you know, I, I don't like these traditions that say it's one quarter of the Quran or one half of the Quran, but you know, there is a tradition that says it's, it's equal to one half of the Quran. You could take that tradition as not as, as you know, praising or, or trying to encourage people to reflect on Zanzana rather than take it literally. Um, but the idea is that for full accountability to occur, there also has to be full exposition. And one of the common themes that they, they talk about here is, for instance, the, the existence of, of, a, of a child of unknown parents, usually the, the product of uh, um, fornication, you know, a child that was left in an orphanage. And it's interesting that they use that imagery when they talk about the zelzana, the, the, you know, either a murdered person or an orphan child. It, what the consequences that will flow within history? So uh, Muslims later, Mufassirun knew that some of the worst genocide makers um, and some of the worst despots in Islamic history were kids who grew up without parents. <laughs> they love to draw this comparison. Well, you know, in the year after when when the the, the when the, the parents who didn't take responsibility for this child and this child grew up to have psychotic murderous tendencies and cause massive genocides uh, and the, their parents realize what they've done because the earth will reveal can you imagine the place these parents, the, the position these parents will find themselves in? I mean, they, they produced a child that they ignored. The child grew up, had a horrible life, became a murderous thing, killed, you know, and of course for, for them, uh, child abuse was not discussed, but abandonment of children was discussed quite frequently and the consequences of abandonment of children. Um, okay. So, then, I'm going to just make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, so, يَوْمَ إِذَنْ يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ أَشْتَاتًا لِيُرَوْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ So, people will emerge in, in, in great numbers for what? To see the consequences of their actions, which is consistent with what we, we've talked about. Now, the, the, the next theme. So if you've done idharra min khair, you will see the full consequence. If you've done an atom's worth of good, you'll see the full consequences. And if you've done an atom's worth of bad, you will see the full consequences. Now there are some interesting narratives and reports that I, I, I must tell you around Surah Zalzala. One, we, we start with uh, the most famous one, is that Surah Al-Zalzala was revealed when Abu Bakr, uh, the companion of the Prophet, والسلام, was having dinner with the Prophet, والسلام, they were sitting, having, eating, and suddenly the, the Prophet receives the revelation and, and recites, and that the effect, some narratives say that the effect on Abu Bakr is that he stopped eating. Other reports saying that he started crying. In either case, um, so Abu Bakr, according to, to this report, uh, tells the Prophet, Oh my Lord, so an atom's worth will have consequences, good or bad. So he, he's, he's concerned about this. And the 
if uh, if uh, if I find the the hadith, I'll, um, I'll read it in Arabic first. Um, yeah. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ responds, "ما يرون في الدنيا مما يكرهون فهو من ذات ويؤخر الخير لأهله في الآخرة." What basically the, the hadith says is that the prophets respond to Abu, uh, to Abu Bakr is that, well, it's as if saying, don't worry, because for those who, for the faithful, Allah takes away from their sins through whatever they suffer on earth. So it, it expatiates your sins, it, it cleans out your sins, whatever hardship you go through. And Allah will reward you for the good deeds in the hereafter. Some traditions go further and say that Allah will inflict hardship on a believer so much so until all sins are clear, cleansed, although these traditions are not as reliable, they're not as authentic. The, this narrative, the one that I just read, it, it, it's <clears throat> most experts of hadith supported its authenticity. <clears throat> uh, the ones that are doubtful uh, are the ones that say that it, Allah will necessarily inflict hardship on the faithful until all their sins is cleansed on this earth and save rewarding them for the hereafter. There are many reports about this point, but what what is a consistent theme in Islamic theology and consistent narratives that we will encounter in other surahs is that as Allah says elsewhere, that those whose understanding is completely earthbound, this is their entire focus. Allah gives them this world and whatever good deeds, since they entirely believed in this world, that's all they believed in, and they've always doubted any other world, it's as if you make your choice. Then the consequences, whatever good deeds you've achieved on this earth, you will reap their consequences on this earth. While those who did not just believe in this world and believed in the hereafter, Allah saves their true reward as they wish for the hereafter. And that's the consistency in the Islamic theology. And when you come to most people with strong aqidah, strong iman, and you tell them you prefer that Allah rewards you for your good deeds on this earth or in the hereafter, invariably they'll tell you in the hereafter. Few, if, and this by the way is a good way to test whether you have strong faith or not. If your response is, well, I'd rather get my reward up front on this earth, <laughs> eh, then you need work to do. But I've always, and this is among the, of course, we Muslims don't talk about the Mu'tazila nearly as, as often as we should, but among the consistent themes, especially among the Mu'tazila, was that it is part of the notions of justice that for those who simply believe in this world, they get their accounting sort of up front. But the problem is, is that they'll have a very heavy bill to pay in the year after. <laughs> While those whose consciousness is hereafter bound, they, they don't settle their debts on this earth, but the reward is safe till the hereafter. And the Mu'tazila, the, the discourses about how that and notions of justice intermingle are fascinating. Yeah, of course, this is also this, this 
uh, these verses are very consistent with elsewhere where the Quran where Allah says La yugaduru kabiratan wala sagira illa ahsaha that the account, Allah's accounting covers every small and big thing. The major though theme in Zalzala is that the, both the honor and the horror of seeing the full consequences, because it, it is, it, it says that you will see that you will see an atom's worse, and you will see doesn't mean you just that you will be rewarded or punished, but you will see the consequences of your actions, good and bad. That is, if you if you sit and you pray on this, it's it's heavy. <clears throat> it's quite heavy to see the full consequences. Now, there there uh, another thing uh, around Surah Zazzal that is very interesting. Reportedly, among the narratives about Surah Zazzal is that there was a group in Medina um, that uh, they, were, they were known to be um, like what we would call today punks. Uh, they were like, you know, young kids, uh, they would eye women in the street, they would whistle at women, um, they would harass women and and so on. And then they, they were told, you know, aren't you ashamed of what you're doing? So they said, well, Allah taught, said in the Quran that Allah will hold you accountable only for the kabair, the major things, and will forgive the sagat, will forgive the small <laughs> sins. And it's very interesting that among the discourses about Surah al zalzala is that after the revelation of the surah, they were confronted with, no, there are consequences even for the smallest, and that this was the, the, this, the first revelation to say that, you know, it, this is the wrong way to, the, to go. If you're simply thinking, well, you know, I'm just going to avoid the big sins, Allah will forgive everything. Well, you don't know until you see the full consequences of good and bad. The other very interesting narrative, which is sort of the other side of the thing, is that there was uh, a, among the, the wealthy in Medina, the, the, there were elsewhere the same individuals that are sometimes described as the hypocrites of Medina, <laughs> is that the, the, the Muslims were famous for giving big sadaqah, big things, but also for giving anything small. So it was quite common, for instance, for poor people to knock at the door of the Prophet or Aisha after the, the uh, um, um, or, or uh, the reports say Aisha, but I'm sure any of the wives, and to say, do you have anything to eat? And then they would be given anything that is at home. Now, apparently, the, 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 these who elsewhere are described as hypocrites, although in the report that I'm talking about, that is usually mentioned in the context of Surah Zazala, they're not described as hypocrites. They were just described as some of the wealthy of Medina, mocked the idea that you give small alms. Like, you know, um, Grace once said, um, I don't remember which talk, but you said something about like doing like small acts of kindness, like mm -hmm. smiles. And so they mocked that idea as sort of silly, like, you know, small deeds, who cares about little small things. Um, and that they were again confronted by Surah Zalzala and sort of embarrassed by Surah Zalzala that no small deed is too small. 
And this is, of course, consistent with a famous hadith by the Prophet ﷺ, who says, that avoid hellfire. And avoid hellfire here is majaz, and all the Muslims tend to take it very literally. But it basically means avoid punishment, avoid the consequences of badness, even with half a date. Meaning, no small deed is indeed small. If all you have is a dime, give a dime. You know, in the old days we might have said a penny, although now a penny is worthless. I mean, but even if that's all you have, give it. You know, if that's what you have. It, it's very, I mean, it, it, um, um, I don't know how many people I've met in my life that tell you, well, the reason I'm not giving is I'm waiting until I have a big thing to give. Um, I've encountered tons of people like that. They, they will not give and they will always be in, in, in project mode. Well, you know, I'm just waiting until I have, and then I'm going to donate. You know, and it's always if just Allah gives me this deal, this project, this promotion, it, it will be my big donation day, and and when it, the day comes, even if they donate some big thing, you know, they feel it's like, it's as if they've given birth to a child, and then it's years before they donate anything else, if they ever donate anything else. Okay, let me make sure, I, mean, I know I'm there, oh, yes, I now remember. Okay, <coughs> you thought we're done? Not, not really. No. And believe me, I am jumping and skipping over tons of stuff. I mean, um, okay. Now, this relates to a little bit hadith methodology, but but not quite. It's not really hadith methodology. It's a demonstration. I mean, I, again, I, I, I never coordinate with Grace about what she's going to talk about because I don't want to suffocate her. Uh, you know, um, but this notion of, of, of using common sense well, some of the issues about the use of common sense and tradition come up very interestingly in Surah al Are you all with me? Yeah. Okay. You're not exhausted yet? No. Take a deep breath. <laughs> When Surah Al-Zalzalah is revealed, we have a set of narratives, a set of ahadiths that one can describe as theologically troubling. Troubling from the perspective, put Isnad on the side for now, put chain of transmission on the side, but from the perspective of logic, reason, justice, and morality. So this is Tafsir al-Tabari. So the narratives go in the following way. That Surah al-Zalzala is revealed, then Aisha, Prophet's wife, asked the Prophet, Rasulullah, she says, O oh Prophet, there was a man called Ibn Jad'an. This man in Jahiliyyah, i.e. before the Islamic revelation, was a man who was kind to Rahim, kind to kin, and he used to feed the poor and take care of orphans. فَهَلْ <coughs> ذَاكَ <coughs> So are any of these good deeds going to be rewarded in the hereafter? And the Prophet says, pointers what? لا ينفعوا. 
إنه لم يقول يوما رب اغفر لي خطيئتي يوم الدين. So the Prophet basically says no, it will do him no good because he said he never said God forgive my sin in the hereafter. Well, he couldn't have said God forgive my sin in the hereafter because this was in Jahiliya. And Ibn Jad'an, of course, it will require that you do some research and who is Ibn Jad'an. And Ibn Jad'an died before the Prophet's revelation. Okay, another narrative. This one, عن عامر الشعبي أن عائشة أم المؤمنين قالت يا رسول الله Okay, this is another Ibn Jad'an one. This is not the one I'm looking for. Um, yeah, so this one. Let's say, عن عامر عن عالقمة أن سلمة بن يزيد الجعفي So سلمة بن يزيد الجعفي قال يا رسول الله أن أمنا هلكت في الجاهلية كانت تصل الرحم وتقري الضيف وتفعل وتفعل فهل ذلك نافعها شيء؟ قال لا لا ينفعها. So Ibn Yazid al Jafi tells the Prophet, My mother, before the revelation, used to do all these good deeds take care of this and that, feed the poor. So, are any of this going to be worth anything in the hereafter? And in this narrative, the Prophet reportedly says, no, it does her no good. Another report, this one, on Abdul Aziz bin Bashir al-Dubbi, and uh, Salman bin Amir, so he comes and he says uh, that my father, were, did all these good deeds before Islam, is that any good? Is that going to benefit it at all? The Prophet said, no, that's not going to benefit him. Okay. So now, so we have Aisha, a report from Aisha, <laughs> for the sake of interest in time, what time is it? 6.42. Uh, okay. So, uh, one from Aisha, another one from a, 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 pro, a companion that talks about his mother, and another, a third one, a companion, excuse me, that talks about his father. And in each of these reports, they're asked, the question is about someone, before even Islam, who has done a lot of good deeds, is that going to be a, a, of any worth to them in, in the hereafter? And the Prophet reportedly says no. Now, if you are, and this is why I, I am always, I say hadith, hadith is not, this is on Tabari. So if, if any contemporary Muslim can pick up Tabari, can read, and can go create havoc. Because he, without knowing who is Ibn Jabdan or who is Ibn Amir or who is what, they see it in the tafsir, they they'll go and they'll say it in the Jum'ah and there you go. And then, of course, they'll have it, they'll, you know, Trabari now is translated and so they, you'll have it on the net. Hadith is not a field for novices. If you are not a scholar, you should read scholars, a scholar you trust, a scholar that you know has rational and scholarly abilities, not simply read hadith. Because now to, to, to fill in the picture for you. These hadiths were extremely, although they're in Tabari, Although you will find them in Mustadrak al-Hakim, and some of them are even in Muslim, and some, there are several versions of them in Nasa'i, they were extremely problematic. And to quote uh, 
the, uh, the, there's a, one of the, the, the big figure, figures in Islamic jurisprudence was a man called Ibn Ka'b al-Qurdi. And Ibn Ka'b al-Qurdi narrates a hadith where the Prophet says the following. ما أحسن من محسن مؤمن أو كافر إلا وقع ثوابه على الله في عاجل دنياه أو آجل آخرته. So now this hadith says any any believer or non-believer who does good or bad, they will earn either the reward or punishment, either on this earth or in the in the hereafter. And this is an, an obligation, a duty upon Allah. So now this hadith seems to be saying exactly the opposite of the other hadith. Now when you sit and you do your due diligence and you spend hours and hours of scholarship and to train a scholar is such a valuable asset because to teach people to look up who these people are chains of transmission, to read the theological debates. So for instance, these hadiths that I recited to you from Aisha, about, and also the hadith about the mother and the father, when you look at Tafsir al-Razi, for instance, you don't find a trace for these hadiths. Why? Because the razi concluded a long time ago that these hadiths are not reliable, and he didn't want to accept them. But among modern Muslims, because the Tabari is translated, Razi is not translated, these hadiths have resurged and re-emerged. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the hadith by the Prophet والسلام, that is far more reliable that tells us it is an obligation upon Allah to reward or punish believer or non-believer for any good or bad they do is still there. Now, it, it, it depends on, now, if you are a rational, believing Muslim, and you're reading Tabar, let's say you've never attended this halakha, and you read this narrative about Aisha, Ibn Jan'an was a kind, giving human being, who died in Jahiliya, or the companion that says, my mother and my father, and they used to do, is this going to be, benefit them at all? And then you ask yourself, could that be? I mean, I read Surah Zalzala, and Zalzala tells me what? Zalzala says, those who do good deeds will see the, the, the results. Those who do evil deeds will see the results. And now I'm reading this hadith that seems to, oh my God, this seems just un, very unethical. So what do you do? You say, I stop. I mean, I'm not going to decide one way or another until I find a scholar that I trust. Because either that or become a scholar yourself. But don't do a half big job of going around spreading what you don't know or, allow, or trusting Islamophobes to create your faith for you. Because I can tell you Islamophobes pounce on stuff like that. That's the stuff they jump on. And they'll leave all the complexity, all the discussions, all the debates, I, none of it. You'll not even get a whiff of it. But they put that, and then our you know, little punks of Muslims in the modern age read this stuff and say, oh, I don't know, I'm having a faith crisis. Well, look at the source you're getting your material from. The web is demonic. You don't know what the... You cannot authenticate. It's like what I tell my students. Don't cite web sources to me. Because the web, as, as we say in, 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 in law, so much of, of a signature or contact, a contract is, an, uh, is authentication. If I can't authenticate it, then it's worthless. And the web cannot be authenticated. So information from the web it's pretty much worthless. It can stimulate your thinking a little bit, but to allow it to define something about the future of your faith, that's silly, absolutely silly.
Okay, before we end, someone just want to make sure. Oh, the, yes, I, I'm, I'm happy that I, I did check. One of the very interesting reports that it would be, we would be remiss if we didn't mention, is that that narrative about the revelation of Surah al zanzala when the Prophet, uh, Ali and Abu Bakr, radiallahu anh, are, have, are eating, and then Surah al zanzala is revealed, so they stop eating. Whether the, whether the report says that Abu Bakr cried or didn't cry, but in either, in either case, he was obviously concerned about, oh my, oh my God, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to see the full consequences of, of my actions one way or the other. And, you know, all of us, I don't care who you are, you know, even if you're in a bad mood one day and, and you, you respond to your child in a, in a way that, even if you regret it one minute later, but you don't know the ripple effects of that response in your child's life and what it's going to do to, and to be confronted with the full consequences. I'll tell you, I lose sleep over that. Surah so Al-Zalzala is one of the things that I don't like to think about at night when it pops and try to fall asleep and it pops in my mind at night, I, 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 I lose sleep because to, to, that is a very heavy order. So Abu Bakr has a similar response like the, the, the you know, so one of the most important hadiths that then be, becomes very significant in Islamic theology is then narrated in that occasion when the Prophet sees how concerned Abu Bakr has become. So the Prophet says, Abu Bakr, let me tell you, if it hadn't been for the fact that you, human being, that human beings commit sins, Allah would have created creatures that commit sins so that Allah can forgive them. So in other words, the Prophet is telling Abu Bakr, yes, but don't freak out. Think of the consequences, but don't freak out because when Allah says, I am most forgiving, I am most Rahman Rahim, I am, Allah means it. And Allah loves forgiveness that Allah, if, if you human beings were angels, Allah wants to forgive. It's like an act of love. Forgiveness is an act of love. Allah wants to forgive. Now, if you have proper modesty and proper manners, you wouldn't take that love for granted. So you wouldn't say, like the, those people in Medina, well, Allah's going to forgive it anyway, so it doesn't matter. That's, that's rude. And being rude with Allah is not appropriate. What I'm trying to, to get at is what Surah al zalzala the, the entire amount of literature in Surah al zalzala is a wonderful lesson in methodology, in pedagogy, in reason, in ethics, and in, in reasonability and rationality in faith. So that at the same time that you Allah, know Allah loves to forgive, but at the same time, you can't be an insolent idiot and take that love for, for granted. Not the type of crazy, um, mechanistic, puritanical literalism that we see displayed by so many modern Muslims. It's far more fluid and far more beautiful and rational than this. Okay, and that's what it is. Yes. And then do Q and A. Yes. Okay.